For the first time in over 100 years, the U.S. is out a Marine Corps commandant. And that is because of one senator who represents roughly 1.5 percent of the American population, Tommy Tuberville of Alabama, who is also on the Armed Services Committee. You have probably been hearing a lot about Senator Tuberville lately for insisting that white nationalists are just American. Tuberville has also been holding up hundreds of top military promotions because he wants to impose forced birth on every American service member and their families. Now, to be clear, abortion procedures are not covered by the Department of Defense unless the mother's life is at risk or the pregnancy is the result of rape or incest. But after the Dobbs ruling last year, the Pentagon issued a new policy granting leave and covering travel expenses for service members in states where abortion is illegal. And that is not a small number. About 40 percent of all women in active duty or DOD civilian jobs now have limited or no access to abortions, a RAND study shows. Congress Congresswoman Mickey Sherrill, a former Navy pilot, noted this today. To do this because he wants to impose, Tuberville wants to impose his own extremist views on service women and military families is really unconscionable. Right now we have women serving across the country who have no access to quality reproductive health services. We are now talking about women who are not just service women but the families of service members who are stationed mm -hmm. in places like Texas, which has about 120,000 active duty service members. Imagine that you have a high risk pregnancy in Texas right now. But Senator Tuberville is determined to grind the American defense apparatus to a halt so he can force those women to carry pregnancies to term against their will. Doug Jones is the former Democratic senator of Alabama who preceded Tuberville, now a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and he joins me now. Um, well, I guess my first question is, what do you think of what Mr. Tuberville is doing, the senator is doing, and, and do you think it, you know, plays well in the state that you represented of Alabama? Well, I, I'm not sure which thing you're talking about. Are you talking about his white nationalist views? Are you talking about his military nominations? Or, or what are we talking There's so many things that I think that he is doing that, quite frankly, Chris, is just embarrassing uh, to the state. Even though there are so many people that might say they support it, I don't think they really fully appreciate, especially on the nominations process, what he's doing. Uh, we, we've, we've got a state that is a strong military presence, strong veteran presence. They understand uh, the need to have these generals promoted, to have them go up the chain, how important that is to morale. Um, that's incredibly important. And the thing involving uh, the abortion policy, Chris, it's not really completely a new policy in the sense that it, the D Department of Defense has paid for people to go out of state, out of uh, area, if, there was, if it was needed. That's a policy that's been in effect because we've got right. to support our military. We've got to support folks. So this is nothing really new. I, I really think that this is an attack, again, on women, I don't think he likes them in the service, doesn't want them in the service, and he's doing what he can to drive them out. You, you mentioned, of course, before the controversy uh, that the senator has engaged in about uh, appearing to def It's unclear. Does he not know what white nationalism is? He, he seems to be skeptical of any efforts by the Department of Defense to find and, and, and block from, you know, joining the service outright white nationalists, right? Um, and he, he doesn't like that. He thinks that it's unclear what he understands about this. this is him talking to our own Ryan Nobles, uh, giving his sort of latest version of this. Take a listen. I wonder if you could kind of clarify for us what you meant on CNN about white nationalism and, and your, generally your thoughts. Yeah, listen, I'm totally against any racism. And I'm told that white nationalism, they consider racism. I'm totally against that. I don't. What is he doing here? Is he uh, is he playing like he doesn't understand, or does he not understand? Do you know? I, I think he is bending to pressure from his colleagues that finally said enough is enough, Senator. Uh, this is wrong. This is wrong to be in the military. Uh, white nationalism is pure racism. It's a racism in its rawest form. Everybody knows that. I, it was just stunning to me that he said, "I'm told." that it was white race. I mean, he told, he told CNN the other night, well, it was just her opinion it was right, white race, uh, that it was racism. It, it is very difficult with him when he says these things, which, by the way, was not his first rodeo. 
on talking about right, white nationalism uh, and including some other racist comments. This is not the first time that has happened. So I think he's bending to some pressure. Uh, it's clear that he really didn't believe it or want to say it. At least that's the impression you get with watching and listening to him, that he was begrudgingly trying to clarify uh, for, for his colleague's sake, not his. Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a good and important point. He, every every bite at the apple, he keeps doing the same thing. Well, you say it's this, and if they say that, then I guess. But I, it's, it's like you could. I mean, you, you're a U.S. senator. You could go read a few books, spend a few hours trying to figure out what the term means. Google it. I don't know. Well, but this this more, thing of like, well, they keep telling Chris, me. Yeah, yeah. More importantly, he's from Alabama. He should know things like this. Remember. This is a guy who, as a candidate, did not know what the Voting Rights Act was. I keep coming back to that because that was the first telltale sign about where he actually stands on things when you don't even know what it is. And he didn't. It was clear that he didn't know that. So a senator from Alabama ought to know our history, ought to know where we are, ought to be on the right side of history uh, and not the wrong side. And he is clearly consistently been on the wrong side of history on this issue as well as the military issue. Doug Jones, uh, who served as senator from Alabama, thank you very much. Over the next few months in Florida, around 100,000 homeowners will find that their homeowners insurance is ending in the middle of hurricane season. And that is because farmers insurance is now the fourth major home insurer to leave the state. It's pretty clear why. Florida, of course, has always been subject to lots of extreme weather, but things have gotten much worse as climate change ramps up. For instance, take a look right now at the ocean temperatures around Florida on Monday. Florida's in white there. That's the ocean around it. That is 90 degrees or higher water temperature. 90 degrees. That's bathtub, hot tub border, nearly unheard of. And this is crucial because the warmth of the ocean is the energy that powers hurricanes. So Farmers is just doing the math. The administration of Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has no actual response to this pressing issue. And so what they've decided to do is, wait for it, attack Farmers Insurance for being too woke. The state chief financial officer released a same, same statement saying, quote, I sincerely believe that with today's actions, Farmers Insurance is well on its way to becoming the Bud Light of insurance. But no amount of culture war is going to solve the basic problem here. Insurers are fleeing the market and insurance premiums are shooting up. Ben Keyes is an economist and a professor of real estate at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. He's been studying the cost of the climate crisis for years, particularly insurance, and he joins me now. Ben, you've given testimony uh, before the Senate on this. You wrote a New York Times uh, op-ed on this. Um, what, what is going on here? This Farmers is not the first, but why are they leaving? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Chris. This is not about wokeness, it's about the weather. Uh, storms have gotten more severe, uh, more frequent. We've already had 12 storms this year um, across the country, or 12 disasters that have been more than billion dollars in, in verified damages. So that's factor number one. Um, factor number two is that the costs of rebuilding have gone up. Um, they've gone up faster than inflation. The cost of materials is very high and the cost of labor in our tight labor market is also very high. And the third is maybe the least woke aspect, which is the reinsurance market. And this is how insurers protect themselves on the back end. And the reinsurers have said, we see the models, we see the data, and we're not willing to insure these portfolios in the ways that we were in the past. And so those three factors are driving insurers to raise premiums, cut coverage, or leave the state entirely. Yeah, so on that last thing, and just to do a little insurance 101, right? So you're running an insurance company, you're taking premiums from people, they're paying little payments as a hedge against catastrophic risk, right? So you're taking in that money, then you got to do something with that money, right? And when a storm hits, right, all of a sudden you've got lots of claims, right? You got to pay that out. And so what the insurers do is they have their own insurers uh, as, as a way of hedging their own risk um, that are like reinsurance companies. And those companies, I understand, have been sort of at the forefront of thinking about climate models, right? Yeah, they have a lot of money at stake. This is their business, is protecting themselves from uh, these types of disasters and pooling risk and spreading it as widely as possible. And so when the alarms go off for the reinsurers, that's when they pass on the, the changing costs to the insurers, and the insurers then pass it on to the homeowners directly. 
You write that even with higher premiums, unpredictable losses are wreaking havoc on the bottom lines of insurers. Ten insurers, ten insurers have gone belly up in Florida in just the last two years. And here's the other thing that is notable to me. I was talking to someone who was in California and talking about the parts of California. It's one thing if your premiums go up, which is terrible, and I think the average in the, the median in Florida is like six thousand dollars a year in home insurance. But it's a whole other thing if insurers just say no, you're, it's uninsurable. I mean, I think there are parts of, uh, you know, parts of California that are very exposed to wildfire risk where it's just like it's not a question of what premium you could pay. It's just you, you can't find insurers. Yeah. And the absence of an insurance policy is deeply troubling for that that community, because without an insurance policy, you're not going to be able to get a mortgage. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac won't issue a mortgage unless you can right. attach an insurance policy to it. And, uh, and without a mortgage, without that kind of financing, housing markets can, can collapse or, or seize up um, in very dramatic ways. And so you know, I think what we're going to see more of is more dependency on um, these state-run insurers of last resort. So like Citizens Insurance in Florida, uh, which now has 1.3 million policyholders, is the largest uh, insurer in the state. And uh, you know, this was set up to be um, you know, very much a stopgap kind of uh, program, and instead it's taken on uh, predominant role in the entire market. So I think we're going to see much more of a role for the state to play um, when there are no private insurers willing to bear the risk. Well, this is, I mean, this is where it's all headed, right? And this is, again, you got to be a little skeptical of the, the insurance companies. I can't quite always take them face, face value, right? I mean, they want to keep their premiums high and their claims low. And they, I think they're also, everyone's looking around for public subsidy, right? So what ends up going to be the case, right? The, the free market, you know, up by your bootstraps, big bad government folks are going to have to, in all these places that are very weather exposed, Texas, Florida, and all throughout the Southeast particularly, are basically, it's going to fall to the government, which is the insurer of last resort, right? And it always is. And so, you know, I think when we're thinking about this idea of the free market, it, the free market is a very circumscribed, plays a very circumscribed role in the insurance market. Insurance markets are very highly regulated. And we have a number of, of programs at state and federal levels um, that provide a ton of support. Um, so the National Flood Insurance Program being the, the clearest example um, of an insurance market where private insurers were unwilling to provide the degree of coverage necessary. And so we needed to nationalize that market and create an entire national market. And you may need to see something similar for wildfires, for instance, going forward, or other types of, of backstops that are going to um, be more resilient than um, what any individual state could put together. Because the uncertainty is, you know, whether these state-run entities will have the political will to charge people the right price. And, and that's what this partly well, comes down to is, you know, is the price going to be set um, to really induce adaptation? Are we going to see meaningful behavior change? And that happens when, um, when people are forced to pay premiums that reflect the risk. So that's, I mean, we, let's just talk about the risk for a second. Here's, I just want to show people again to, to remember where we are as I speak to you the summer of 2023. This is daily temperature, summer 2023. You'll see that curve there, and then there's a line at the top. That's where we are. We're, we're, we're sort of off the chart, daily temperature, 2023. That's us right there at the top, right? This is sea surface temperature. Um, you can get a sense of what the, what's going on in the water, the sea surface temperature. Again, that's us at the top in red, 2023, right, off the chart. That point about adaptation is the ultimate one, which is it's not good. I mean, what's going to happen, what I fear, is that we subsidize people living in the path of disaster. And that's going to be really destructive. But that looks like the way we're headed in states like Florida. What do you think? Well, that's what we've done for decades. So through the National Flood Insurance <laughs> Program, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which don't price uh, geographic risk uh, of their loans, through many other federal programs, uh, we subsidize living in harm's way. And, and I think the, the big question that's going to face local, state, and federal policymakers is, is who's going to bear those risks going forward? Are we going to be willing to continue to subsidize that type of living, or are we going to make those who are choosing to live in the most exposed areas Pay the price. No. Yeah. All right. Ben Keyes, uh, who's been a, a really key uh, resource on this for me. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.